Okay, okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to tell you about some work that we've been doing on submodular maximization and using submodular maximization to summarize large data sets. This is joint work with my PhD student, Baharan, Mr. Suleiman, uh, Ashwin Badanitiru, who's at Google, um, Amin Kabasi, who's a former postdoc in the group, now professor at Yale, as well as Rick Sarkar from the University of Edinburgh. So this is the submodularity session, so by now you're all excited about submodular functions. I'll keep it very brief. To recall the setting, so we want to deal with set functions, mapping subsets on some finite set V uh, to the reals, characterized by a natural notion of diminishing returns that says uh, that my uh, gain is going to be larger in the context of a small set than in the context of a superset. Okay. And as Francis was already saying, uh, submodularity has very important implications for optimization. He uh, discussed implications for uh, minimization, um, but turns out that submodularity also has very important concave aspects, which you can partly see from the definition. And uh, as a consequence, there's quite a bit known actually about uh, submodular maximization. Uh, exact maximization is hard, but there's good approximation algorithms. Okay? And given the importance of discrete structures in machine learning, data mining related fields, uh, it's no, maybe it's no, no surprise that over the recent years, the community has been exploring a number of applications related to both submodular minimization and maximization, uh, ranging over problems such as uh, variable selection, probabilistic models, uh, clustering, active learning, experimental design, document summarization, um, uh, <coughs> sparsity-inducing norms, dictionary learning, probabilistic modeling, and many others. Okay, far too many to mention here. So what I would like to do today is to tell about one application that received quite a bit of interest in the recent years, which is about summarizing large data sets. Okay, suppose we take all the images on the web, or maybe at least those we took on our last vacation, and we'd like to uh, pick a small representative uh, subset of those, right? Or imagine sort of we wear a camera and record our lives, we'd like to have a small diary, or we uh, uh, sort of record uh, our physiological activities using sensors, uh, we try to summarize news feeds and social networks, and so on, okay? So in all of those, what we'd like to do is we'd like to extract a small representative subset out of a big data set. Okay? And it turns out for a lot of those uh, applications, this problem can be formalized as the problem of maximizing some submodular utility function f over subsets of this original data set. Okay? Many such functions arising. I'll give you some examples later. For now, let's just use this abstract uh, concept. Okay? And we'd like to maximize this, maybe subject to some constraint. We can pick at most uh, k items, pick at most k dishes from the menu. Okay, so here's a very simple uh, algorithm for uh, submodular optimization that's sort of akin to gradient descent, which basically uh, works like this. So what you're going to do is you're just going to score every single element, how valuable is it taken on its own, and then we're just going to uh, pick the uh, biggest one and add it to our set. Okay, then we proceed by scoring the next element in terms of how much do we gain on top what we already have and add the biggest one to our set and keep going so until we have uh, picked all our k dishes from the menu, right? Okay, and so now in general, greedy algorithms can do bad, but uh, one of the uh, celebrated results about submodular maximization is that this really simple greedy algorithm is guaranteed to at least not to do too badly if your function is submodular. In particular, you can prove that it uh, is going to give you a constant fraction 1 minus 1 over e, a value that evaluates to roughly 63% of the optimal value. And moreover, that's the best approximation ratio you can achieve if you insist on uh, polynomial time tractability. So in a sense, it's a near optimal result. Okay. Now, sort of for maximization, if that's the problem we want to deal with, right? Sort of the greedy algorithm is kind of a prototypical fast algorithm. Maybe the story ends there, right? But it turns out that if you really deal with very large data sets, then this classical algorithm might actually reach its limits, right? So for example, you might not have random access to your buffet, but walk one dish after each other, right? So data might arrive, you read it sequentially from disk, um, it arrives maybe at the pace that you can't even store everything. Uh, and so it's very natural to ask whether it's possible to summarize a data set, select, so select a good subset on the fly without having seen the entire data set on its, uh, on its own, right? So are they good streaming algorithms? Algorithms to submodular maximization. 
Okay? So this question has received quite a bit of attention. There's a number of proposals out there um, that um, all have really nice algorithmic ideas, but have some uh, issues and restrictions. In particular, a lot of the algorithms require more than one single pass, so you have to go through the buffet a couple of times uh, before you fill your plate. Um, there's also other uh, restrictions that they might uh, use a lot of memory, for example, and so on. Okay, and so what I'd like to tell you about is one um, very, very simple algorithm that actually has none of those uh, issues and actually works pretty well in practice. Okay, so let me give you some of these ideas that will also tell you a bit about what's the role of submodularity here. Okay, good. Now let's start with the first attempt. That's a really simple algorithm. Okay, and let's start with the assumption that someone tells us the value of the optimal solution. Okay, so we somehow get to know that value. Okay, now here's a very simple thing we could do. Okay, we're going to process one element at a time, and we look at whether its gain is going to be some substantial fraction of the value that's still left in the data that we haven't seen yet. Okay, so we compare against the uh, optimal value that we could get, and what we want to do is we pick an element if it provides at least a good fraction of that remaining value. Okay, and so we uh, sort of process elements one at a time, always compare against the threshold, and uh, we stop once we filled our set. Okay. It's a very, very simple algorithm, just a single pass of the data, constant uh, update time, uh, order K memory, and it actually gives you a half of the optimal value. Okay, so that would be pretty cool. The problem is that we can't actually run this algorithm because we don't know the value of opt, right? In fact, computing that is NP hard. Okay, now this is where submodularity uh, comes in handy as well. So it turns out that we don't need to know opt exactly, we can try to estimate it. Okay, suppose that instead of knowing the value of the optimal set, we just know the value of the biggest singleton. Okay, so for, for all the dishes taken on their own, what's their value taken in isolation? Okay, let's call that M, and then by submodularity, we know that op must be between M and K times M. Okay, because the marginal gain can only go down in the context of having picked more and more dishes already. Okay. And so now what you can do is we can take that range, discretize it by giving some tolerance epsilon, and then guess a bunch of different values of opt and use those in the algorithm that we ran in the previous slide. Okay? So you essentially maintain a whole bunch of different candidate solution sets here. Um, uh, we'll call them sieves because we sort of uh, filter through the elements and process one element uh, at a time, add them uh, to the sets where sort of they exceed their respective thresholds. Okay? And we, again, go through the entire data set until we win. OK, and if at any given time we are asked what's the set that you want to produce, the summary that you want to output, you just pick the, be the best among those sieves, best among those candidate solutions in terms of value. OK, so that's again just a single pass, uh, gives you a half minus epsilon approximation. Now, in memory and update time goes up a little bit, right, because you have to use multiple candidate solutions, not just one, but number is just log k over epsilon. OK, so that's not, uh, not too bad. Uh, the problem, of course, is how do you get to know the value of the biggest single? So one thing you could do is you could do a second scan through the data to just compute that number, right? But then you need two passes, OK? The one thing you can do is you can actually try to estimate m lazily on the fly. So what you basically do is you just um, basically have your current guess on what that value m is, use the corresponding buckets or sieves, right? Process the data, keep updating m as you keep going. And at some point, you might encounter a new element that gives you a lot of value, like the sunset here, right? So now at some point, some of those sieves become irrelevant and some others you have to create, right? And then you'll keep processing the elements and so on. Okay? So it has basically the same. Uh, roughly the same uh, properties on the previous slide. Memory goes up just by a small constant, uh, update time too, but that's basically it. Okay, so it's a really, really simple algorithm, very easy to implement, and actually has sort of ticks all these boxes of an algorithm that you might want to have for the setting. Okay, so here's the pseudocode, and just to summarize, that's the first streaming algorithm that we know of uh, for cardinality constraints with module maximization, which is an abstraction for a lot of problems in data summarization. That gives you a half approximation, minus epsilon, a single pass of the data, order k log k memory, log k update time, and the, you really only need monotones of modularity. So whatever you can model using that notion, you can apply this algorithm to. Okay, so let me show you some numerical examples. So people have looked a lot at what are suitable objective functions that are sort of uh, handcrafted for different types of summarization tasks. I'll just give you two simple examples here. There's a lot more sophisticated variants that have been considered in the literature. If you want to know more about those, come talk to me. 
Okay, so the first one uh, is a notion of exemplar-based clustering, right? So uh, what we might want to do is we might just want to try to pick a small subset of items and sort of use them as, as, as exemplars to represent the other items. We might be given some sort of uh, distance function or divergence or something like this and essentially evaluate the quality of the solution using a k-median-like objective that essentially just uh, counts as cost for each element the distance to its closest exemplar. Okay? If you look at the reduction in k-median cost, that's a monotone submodular function. Okay? Now, that holds no matter what properties you have. You don't need symmetry, you don't need a triangle inequality, and so on. So it's a lot of modeling freedom that you get out of this. Okay? So that's a very simple example. Another one comes from non-parametric learning. Okay, so uh, suppose we'd like to do non-parametric regression or classification or some such thing, uh, then what you often might want to do is to fit a non-linear function f um, by modeling it as a linear combination of kernel evaluations chosen at our data points, right? So the problem that, uh, that uh, you might get in a, a kernelized support vector machine, for example. Right? And now, in general, you'll have a lot of dual variables, one for each data point. Right? So what's done in practice sometimes is to try to reduce that number by picking a small subset of data points and then just look at functions that are in the span on that subset. Right? And so now the question is, how do you pick that subset? And uh, now what you'd like to do is you'd like to sort of capture the variation in this objective function. So one metric that's been uh, proposed here, uh, for example, in the context of the informative vector machine, is just to look at the log determinant of the gram matrix induced by the kernel associated with the set of points that you've picked. That's a monotone submodular function. Okay? So here's two examples. There's plenty more out there, right? But these are two concrete ones, um, and you can try to greedily optimize this. Okay? Good. So uh, uh, now just some numerical samples. Here's some experiments. So we run uh, on a bunch of different uh, data sets. Here first, we compare against the stream greedy algorithm. That's sort of the previous benchmark on uh, streaming submodular maximization. And the cost and utility, cost in terms of function evaluations, is just normalized to be 100%. One thing you might want to do is just pick points at random, right? That's obviously very fast, but doesn't give you a lot of utility. And if you use the C-streaming algorithm, you get almost all the utility at a tiny fraction of the cost. OK, and so this is for one particular instantiation of k for this problem. But of course, you can vary that as well, right? And you get similar effects. OK, so the same for this non-parametric regression problem. So this is a problem that comes out of a click prediction task uh, on a log of 45 million user visits, um, and the WebScope data released by Yahoo kindly. And so uh, here, again, we have similar effects, right? Stream greedy is normalized to 100%. Random uh, gives you a small fraction of the utility, but of course, very fast. And see streaming is sort of uh, in the middle. You can see almost uh, all the utility at a very, very small fraction of the cost. OK. Good. So uh, uh, that's some uh, examples uh, about streaming submodular uh, optimization and maximization. But what if your data set is so big that you can't even fit it on disk of a single machine, right? It might spread, uh, be spread across a cluster. OK, so one very natural question is, is there any room of parallelism, right? So uh, Francis talked about parallel submodular minimization. Is there something you can do about parallel submodular maximization? OK, so the first thing you might try to do is you might take the greedy algorithm and just parallelize the key subroutine, namely the selection of the next elements that you might want to pick. Right? So that can easily be parallelized. The problem is that uh, you have to communicate after every single element has been selected. Right? And if you think about picking maybe a few tens of thousands, or hundred thousands of points in a non-parametric learning problem out of a data set of say, size a billion, say, right, then good luck trying to run this greedy algorithm. Okay? So uh, uh, now the question is, can you do it with less communication? And here's a very, very simple naive algorithm that we could try to run. It works as this. So we take the entire data set, we split it onto M machines, say, in a cluster, right? And now what we could do is we could just try to find, say, a solution on each of those machines, say, of size k over M, right? Add them all together to produce our output A, right? And uh, output this as the solution. The problem with this is obviously that there could be sort of one machine that has a lot of good elements, all the others have nothing, and we end up with a solution that only gives you a sort of uh, a one over n fraction in terms of utility. Okay? Now, here is a slight modification of this algorithm uh, that actually works uh, really quite well. So, what you might want to do is instead of picking k over m elements at each machine, you just pick k elements at each machine. Throw them all together. But now, of course, you're left with more than k elements, right? k times m elements. Now, how to get those down? Well, just again, run the greedy algorithm to pick k out of these m elements. So just do it in two stages. Okay, so the question is, can any be, anything be said about this algorithm? Right? It's sort of 
One of the simplest parallel schemes you could imagine, right? Minimal communication, very easy to implement in sort of MapReduce type uh, computation models. Okay, now first uh, observation, if the objective function is modular, so additive, just the sum of eights, then it's pretty easy to see that the, this algorithm is optimal, basically just distributed sorting. Okay, also if you just pick a single element, obviously it's optimal. If it's a general monotone submodular function, it's not optimal. Okay, and in fact, if you don't make any assumptions on how the data is being partitioned, then it scales roughly as 1 over square root m. So better than 1 over m, but about 1 over square root m in terms of the number of machines. So that so that's, looks pretty bad. Okay, and so uh, um, uh, before we give up on that algorithm, let's just sort of see how does it actually do. So here's some experiments. Uh, on, uh, on real data. So first of all, you might just, so what the y-axis here is just the fraction that you get using this distributed algorithm compared to just running the greedy algorithm on the full data set, which is our benchmark solution. Uh, so this is just if you pick uh, points at random, um, hopefully you do, can do better than this. Uh, you might want to randomly select elements and then re run greedy on top. There's a bunch of other benchmarks I'm not going to discuss. And there's uh, one missing line here, and that's the missing line, uh, the line from this previous greedy algorithm, and essentially uh, the value is 1. Okay? So it basically gives you almost exactly the same solution as the centralized uh, greedy algorithm, which is very much at odds with this sort of negative result in the previous slide. Okay, and we were really puzzled by this and sort of tried to understand what happens here. And so one thing we were able to show is that there are some explanations. So for example, if it's not just an arbitrary abstract submodular maximization instance, but this objective function satisfies some natural smoothness conditions, the data set satisfies some density conditions, and the data is spread uniformly at random across the machines, you can sort of analyze how much does the approximation quality degrade. And under good situations, you get a solution that's provably almost as good as the centralized solution. And recently, there was some very nice work in the theory community that actually sharpened the analysis um, where you can get a constant factor approximation where the only assumption that you need to do is uh, to assume that the data is partitioned uniformly at random across the machines. Okay, so no geometric structure required. Okay, so uh, uh, again, some experiments. So this is the same WebScope data set I described uh, to you before. Uh, so here, we can just barely run the greedy algorithm, so it takes uh, a bunch of hours, but we can, uh, one can do it. Um, and uh, you can run this uh, parallel algorithm, and you essentially get near linear speed up, up to the point where in the second stage, again, you have to solve a problem that's about the same scale as in the first stage. Right? Of course, at some point, you're going to get into problem there, right? but for a very large uh, extent, you actually get almost linear scaling. Okay, and we also run it in instances where we can't run the centralized greedy algorithm. This is this image collection summarization example, and there it's still does a lot better than these, uh, these naive uh, baselines I was trying to describe before. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to uh, tell you about. Uh, so a lot of problems in machine learning require data summarization. That problem can be ab is addressed in an abstract manner, um, I think pretty naturally and nicely as constraints of modular maximization. And that gives a very nice use case of trying to scale up classical algorithms uh, for submodular optimization, such as the greedy algorithm. I told you about two uh, uh, lines of work that we've been uh, exploring here, right? Streaming algorithms, parallel uh, optimization, but there's a lot more one can look at. So, uh, so we have an upcoming GMLR paper on sort of handling uh, constraints beyond the cardinality constraints. We have an upcoming NIPS paper on solving distributed coverage problem, where instead of controlling the size of the set, you have control the quality of the solution and you want to just find the smallest set as possible, sort of a generalization of the set cover problem, um, and so on. And there's some really interesting, intriguing uh, theoretical open questions here. So, for example, the streaming algorithm gives you a half approximation, versus we know that sort of the information theoretically optimal uh, polynomial time constant is the 1 minus 1 over e, which is about 63%. Uh, uh, so there's a gap here. We don't know whether it's possible to actually uh, close that gap in the streaming setting. Same for constant number of rounds parallel computation. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Thanks.